Good evening, everyone. I have a couple announcements to make before we get started. You too. Um, first off, um, our good friends Butch and Norma. Butch is not doing well. Um, he's dealing with some heart failure issues. Uh, it's not looking promising. So if you guys, if anyone would like to get with me, if you're interested in, maybe we could do meals or if you would like to donate financially or anything, whatever you want to, whatever laid on your heart, uh, you can get with me afterwards. Um, second, we have, uh, we've been invited to Harmony's Who? It's H-O-O, -O, Harmony Outreach and Others. That's the Who. And then it's this Saturday, the 26th, 6.30 p.m. to 8.30. It's Jam and Bread is their theme. It's outside. Bring long chairs. It's to feed the spirit, mind, and body. It's going to be live music and feature a variety of stuffed bread. That's the Jam and Bread. Music and bread. Their pastor is Italian and makes homemade bread. So that is worth going for right there. So, I will post this out there. We're all invited to that. That's this Saturday evening. And the third thing is, um, it's up here. Ignite 365 Outreach is now a legal nonprofit. And on our website, you can donate through Givelify. It would, it's on our website. Our website is ignite365outreach.com. Uh, if you go to that website, you can donate through there, and you can print off a receipt from there. So, just for future reference, if you want to donate um, or tithe or whatever, that's how you can do it. Now, starting within a couple days, I think. Hey, let me add something. So, uh, we got an offering out there, and we have um, prayer requests out there. But just so everybody knows, nobody in here is a paid employee. This is an outreach. Yes. And everybody's involved in the outreach. So all the money goes to the outreach. So if you yes. have something or know somebody that needs something, that's what this is for. So say, hey, I got a family. Their heat's going to be shut off. They need like 200 bucks. That's what the outreach is for, to be in the hands and feet of Jesus. Yes, all donations go to outreach. Everyone is a volunteer. Thank you, everyone. Praise the Lord. I double their pay every week. <laughs>
Heavenly Father, we thank you and we praise you that you are so good and that you do seem to pick us up over and over again. And I praise you, God, because we get to see in the workplace the difference of a life without you and the difference of one that has you. And God, we pray that tonight you would help us to be lights to those who are in such desperate need of you. God, we pray that you would break our hearts for them. As yours was broken for us so much so that you died. God, let me love them enough to die. Just even enough to pray for them and bring them to you. But God, we are so grateful to be here tonight. To be blessed to be among your people. God, we pray that you feel lifted up tonight. But God, we just invite you to change us, to move us. And as Pastor Tim prayed in the back, just to have your way. You've got to have your way in this place tonight. In each of us. In Jesus' name.
sometimes we, we go through stuff and we're, we do not ever get answers, do we? To trust that it's all good. Because he is all good. So I'll take it all. Because there's just nothing in him that's bad. Nothing in him that's dark. Everything is wonderful and everything is lovely. So sing that it, um, with assurance that you know it. Tell you know. So here I am to worship.
How we praise you. There is nothing better. God, we just invite you to invade us. Just make us a people on our knees. A church body on our knees. And God, we bring our friend Butch and his wife Norma to you. And we leave them out the front. They are good people. We've come to love, and so are we hurt with them. There is nothing better than knowing a king I can live on with. And so God, I praise you for his time here. And I pray, God, that these days with his wife are a beautiful thing. And if there is any healing that needs to take place, God, I pray that you reign in those moments that they have together. I know the difference that they make. And God, when you take him home, we look forward to the same celebration when we get there. And I praise you and thank you for making it happen for us that we can't imagine, but that we also get you here. So God, we pray for Pastor Brian as he comes and he teaches us about your word. God, help us to be hungry. In Jesus' name, amen. The family and the loved ones. Lord, you know the situation. You know the hurting hearts. We pray that uh, a prayer of strangers, Lord, may come from us to you and from you to them, Lord, to soothe their, their pain. Let this be a time, Lord, if nobody knows you in the family, that this will be a time where they are drawn to you, Lord, and their hearts are open to receive you, Lord. We pray for comfort, consolation, and above all, you be glorified. In Jesus' name, amen. So we're, we're, we're working through the Sermon on the Mount. And if anybody's ever just read it, Matthew 5 through 7, you come away with the realization, how am I going to get to heaven? How can I live up to this? I lust all the time. I don't wish that anything good upon my enemies. If anything, I just ignore them. I don't go out of my way to bless them and love them. I'm more like the, 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 the religions that say to kill the infidels. That's my heart sometimes. Instead of going with love to people, uh, I just ignore them or I go with less than love. I mean, I, am I pure in heart all the time? No. Do I uh, love my neighbor like I should? No. And you go through these, you go, how can I make it to heaven? Just be thankful for God's mercy. His mercies are renewed daily. His mercy is a continual renewal with you. His grace is sufficient for you. Without that mercy, without that grace, we're all going to fall short. That's God pouring into our lives. Jesus is giving this. He's saying, this is what people who are going to be in my kingdom are going to look like. He says, this is what my kingdom is going to look like. And these are going to be with the people that live in it and operate in it. This is what they're going to look like. But Jesus wouldn't have to went to the cross if we could live these truths out perfectly. If we could always operate in this spirit of uh, not committing murder, not committing adultery. Because if people are looking, hey, I kept the Ten Commandments, I'm good. And Jesus says, we're going to get to it. No, 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 no. If you lust, you are an adulteress at heart. If you hate your brother, or if you hate anybody, you're a murderer at heart. He takes it to a whole new level. Or you're thinking, wait a second, who can be saved then? And like the Apostle Paul says, I am so wretched. Who can, who can pull us out of this state of despair and set hell boundness? He says, I thank God, the Lord Jesus Christ. So it's all about Jesus. Like that song said, there's nothing better than you. But the world is always looking for what can I do? Replace that too. I need a God substitute. I need a Jesus alternative. That's what the world is trying to do. That nothing better than you compartment that makes you spiritually alive. That's the only thing that'll fit in there. Have you ever tried to um, put a charger that don't fit into that type of phone in? That's what the world does with their soul. 
They try to plug in things that weren't designed for that. There's a plug, and it looks like a cross. And that's Jesus in your life. And that's what the only thing that can plug into your life, which will give it power, which will energize it, which will, in fact, bring it to life, is Jesus Christ. But people try to take that trapezoid, and they try to plug it in to that uh, square rectangle hole, and the trapezoid won't fit into the rectangle. And any other thing you try to put in besides Jesus, your good looks, your works, your bank account, your Facebook friends, your, your uh, philanthropy, none of that is going to fit in that hole. It's going to give you nothing but hell. You have a handful of hell, and you're going to have eternal life full of hell because you have rejected the only way to have your life reborn. And that is through Jesus Christ. So we're going to the Sermon on the Mount. And Jesus is called his disciples. He just said, come follow me. I will make you fishers of men. And we learned last week what that meant. To I will make you. Jesus wants to make you something. Jesus has a, we learned today in our study with Sarah, that Jesus has a unique plan for you. Uniqueness. As in, designed for you. That won't fit as somebody else. That is not meant for somebody else. And we learned that uh, he called his disciples up onto that mountain. That's why it's called the Sermon on the Mount. And his disciples were there. And other people that are probably followers of him were there. And he's telling them, this is what my kingdom looks like. And these are what those who are of my kingdom will look like. So it's talking about kingdom citizens. Now we go to the Beatitudes where he says, poor spirit and hunger and thirst after righteousness. If your appetite isn't for the things of God, you are not hunger and thirsty after righteousness. You are not saying there's nothing better than you. You're saying, I am going to find an alternative, a substitute, but there is none. If your appetites are not on God and His kingdom agenda, then you are not hunger and thirsty after righteousness. You are not poor in spirit. You are not seeking the things of God. So now we're moving into Mark or Matthew 5, verses 13 through 16. So I'm going to go ahead and read that first. Verse 13. You are the salt of the earth. But if salt has lost its taste, how shall its saltiness be restored? So he's talking to the Christians. Well, they would be called Christians, yeah. But he's talking to his believers who are there, his disciples. So let's just say Jesus is talking to his disciples and anybody who would be a disciple from there on out. So all of us who call ourselves Christians and say by the blood of Jesus that that is our testimony, that we are his disciples. So he says, disciples of mine, you are the salt of the earth. But if salt has lost its taste, how shall its saltiness be restored? It is no longer good for anything except to be thrown out and trampled under people's feet. You are the light of the world. A city set on a hill cannot be hidden. Nor do people light a lamp and put it under a basket, but on a stand. And it gives light to all in the house. In the same way, let your light shine before others. So that you may see, so that they may see your good works and give glory to your Father who is in heaven. Let us pray. Lord, thank you for your word. Thank you for living through us, energizing and equipping us. And uh, I just pray that this sermon and uh, all that, the praise and worship that we're, we're doing today, Lord, that we just understand you inhabit the praises of your people and give us, Lord, a, a filling today where we can go out and do what you command of us. You say we are salt and we are light, Lord. Not something we're looking forward to, not something we can do uh, when we feel like it, but something that we are and we are to be doing. So help us to grow this day, Lord, to your glory. In Jesus' name, amen. So, you are the salt of the earth, you are the light of the world. He goes on and says, if, if, if saltiness doesn't have, if it's lost its flavor, it's no good for nothing. So you cannot substitute, you can't say, God, I'm a follower of you. He's saying to you right now, you're going to go out into the world, and you're going to affect the world. Just like salt affects everything it comes in contact with. Ice, it affects Steel, it affects. We have signs at work on the big steel racks that hold the raw steel. It says, 
No salt. Do not salt around here. So when the big salt trucks come in, when we have a heavy snow, they're not allowed to go around the steel racks because it will corrode and rust the steel. So steel affects everything it comes in contact with. And God is saying, go out into this dark world and be a light which illuminates, which brings into contrast and view and be something that's going to change everything it comes in contact with. So you can't sit back and go, okay, we talked about pew warmers today. God doesn't call pew warmers. It doesn't say in the Beatitudes, blessed are the pew warmers. Blessed are those people who punch the hole in the part, and when they get to so many Sunday school classes, they get a pendant that they put on for perfect attendance. He doesn't say anything about the pew warmers. It's what you do outside of the pew. It's how you live your life in this dark and flavorless world. So he says, be salt. You can't, he, you can't say, God, I don't want to be salt. Can I be something? Can I be Mrs. Dash? Or can I be a salt substitute? <laughs> Mrs. Dash is not going to cut it. He says, you need to be salt. You can't say, can I be some other form of illumination, which doesn't put me out in an area where I can be persecuted. It's not going to get me out of my comfort zone. Can I be some kind of maybe a dimmable light, which I can turn down real low? I'm still a Christian. But I'm not out there attracting all the heat. And I'm not getting all those people spitting on me and calling me a bigot and persecuting me. He doesn't say that. Jesus never waters anything down. He says, if you're comfortable in your pew, stay in your pew. He doesn't say that. He says, they persecuted me, they're going to persecute you. If you're a follower of me, you're going to have tribulation. So he calls you to be salt of the earth. Salt changes everything it comes in contact with. And we're, we can be salt and light because of that cross. Jesus went there so that we can, in effect, have a power that comes from above. It says we are born again. That means we are born from above. Here's our power source. Here is how we are alive. And here's where our residency is. We are kingdom residents of heaven. But we're here on earth. But he says, be in the earth, but you're not of the earth. But he has us here in a mission. You're here on the earth. You are powered by my spirit living in you. And I want you to affect things for my kingdom. And the cross changes everything. And just like the first thing, uh, what's not on here yet? But salt, what does salt do? It adds flavor. It acts as a preservative. It melts coldness. It heals wounds. It's used for all those things. Back in the old day, the, the saying, you're not worth your salt. Has anybody ever heard that? You're not worth your salt. Salt was a payment back in biblical times. Salt was such a valuable commodity that they would pay the Roman soldiers in salt. I imagine other currencies as well. But a lot of times they'd pay them in salt. That's how valuable a commodity it was. And uh, if the soldier wasn't doing everything he was supposed to be doing, he wasn't pulling his weight, he wouldn't get paid. And he says, you're not worth your salt. You're not getting paid. You're sleeping on the job. You're doing whatever. It has flavor. We as believers, you got to remember, we are like a sore thumb. We should look like a sore thumb. You shouldn't be able to pick us out. We shouldn't blend in with the other fingers on the hand. We shouldn't be, you shouldn't be able to say, oh, I didn't know you were a Christian. Oh, whoops, I lived next to you for 40 years, and we worked at the same job for 30 years, and we worked right next to each other, and we ate in the break room every day, and you didn't know I was a Christian. Well, that's probably because you weren't acting like a Christian. When you act like a Christian, and when you live these spiritual truths out, no, we can't live up to all these truths. We can't do those in our own strength. But with the grace of God in our lives, we're going to do a whole heck of a lot better than we would be as unregenerate people that's only operating with our soul in a body with a spirit that's dead. You can't even fathom to live a pure life or to seek after righteousness and thirst after it and hunger after it without the grace of God, without a living spirit in you. So that's the only way we can do any of this. Salt melts coldness. And there's a lot of cold people out there. There's a lot of cold hearts because they're dead. We need to bring flavor. We need to bring life into it. It, he, it was used as an anesthetic. It, it healed wounds. People would rub it on uh, to, to heal stuff as a healing agent. But it, the, the biggest thing that salt was used for in the biblical times, because we've got to put it into that biblical context, is it was used as a preservative. It kept things from decaying, from becoming putrid, from rottenness, from corruption. 
That's what it was. It was before refrigeration. It was used as a preservative. So God is saying, we need to go out in the world and we need to affect people. We need to change what we come in contact with. If we come in contact with a hard heart, faith comes by hearing the word. This is what we're going out with. We're not going out with uh, Dear Abby. We're not going out with the horoscopes and telling people about what they can look forward to. We're not going out and telling people about this is how you can live your best life now. We're going out and telling people that the King of Glory laid aside his riches and came here to be a servant and to be slain in our place so that we may have life. That's the gospel we're preaching. That's the grace that God gives. His son Jesus Christ and his shed blood that we may have life. So we need to go out with that message. You know what? Sarah, we're talking about that unique thing, purpose, a plan that God has for everybody's life. Here's what we do. And I made this analogy earlier. If you guys watch baseball, you guys seen the pitchers and the catchers. Imagine God being the catcher and he's given the signs. Okay? And each sign means something different. A fastball, a curveball, a changeup, a slider, a screwball. My brother used to have a pitch with the ball. It was called the Sunday Dipper. Okay? I don't know if Major Leagues have the Sunday Dipper, but it's got all these changes. And God says, here's your plan in life. Here's what it is. And here's what I want you to do. And he gives a signal. What do we do? We shake him off. Like that pitcher doesn't like that call. No, no. No, no. Pew warmer? Yeah, I'm going to do that. Let's do it. I'll be a pew warmer. No! God gives you your duty. God gives you your calling. You go and do it. So when God gives you the signal, one, I'm supposed to be salt. You take that pitch and you throw the salt pitch. When he says to be light, you take that pitch. You don't shake it off and go, I want something in my comfort zone. Give me a comfort zone sign. No, he wants to send you out. So when God calls you into something, your unique plan, it's going to have proclaiming the gospel. So when you go to college and you're interacting with all those people, your saltiness is going to rub off on them. When you're working in the factory and you're around all those people, your light is going to shine where that they're going to say something is different about you. It's because you're a power source. I am plugged in. I am being powered by the eternal, everlasting God of everything. So, be salt. Change everything around you. And you're doing that by the grace of God. That's what Paul said to Colossians. Be wise in the way you act toward outsiders. Okay, this is the dark world that you're bringing your light into. So you are bringing your light and your saltiness into this dark world. And he says, make the most of every opportunity. Let your conversation be always full of grace. Seasoned with salt. Your conversation seasoned with salt. Full of grace. Okay, so we see a connection here between grace that has been given to us and grace we're also supposed to be coming in love and grace to other people. We don't go into this lost world and hit them over the head with the Bible and tell them they're going to hell. We say, look, we're all hell bound. But God sent His Son. You do it in love. You do it in grace. You season it with salt. Jesus, had, Jesus didn't go around drop kicking people and beating them. You can't beat anybody into the kingdom of heaven. Just get that understood. You can't beat anybody there. So make your conversation, make your way of life be one that is full of grace so that you may know how to answer everyone. So salt and grace. Let your speech, let your conversation be always full of grace, seasoned with salt. So that's here's what he's saying. What a person say must be tempered with grace. Speaking truth might be right, but it must be flavored with wisdom, grace, and love. Yes, if you reject Jesus Christ, you're going to hell. That's right. But there's a way you can do it with wisdom, with grace, and with love. And that's going to win more people because we're not gonna, he's not setting us out here to always get turned down and to always be rejected. But when you are rejected, you don't know what's going to happen to that person when they depart or a year down the road. You are called to water, plant. Somebody else might water, but you're, you have to go out and plant this seed. 
Let God take care of the rest. He's the one that's going to bring the increase. So don't always go out there with your salt and your son and be thinking that you're going to talk about Jesus Christ and salvation with wisdom, grace, and love. And don't think you're always going to come up empty. And don't think you're always going to be having all these converts. It doesn't matter what you see as immediate results. Your duty is to go, proclaim the gospel, water it, teach, disciple people, and let God worry about multiplying that. But we must be flavored. We must have that seasoning with wisdom, grace, and love. He goes on to say, be the light of the world. You are the light of the world. Okay? The light of the world. We're talking about spiritual. This is spiritual stuff here. The light of the world. The world is in a state of cursedness, fallenness, outside of the will of God. And it is therefore dark. The deeds of men are dark. So we are to be the light of the world. So where light enters, dark is dispelled. Where light increases, darkness decreases. Okay? But again, we need to, do, to be worried about the process. Doing it. And let God worry about the outcome. So... We are the light of the world. A lot of people think, okay, I'm a believer in Christ. I'm not going to get caught up in, in to, to politics. I'm not going to get caught up in, in this. And, and I'm not going to go out and, and share the gospel of Christ wherever I go. I'm saved. I know where I'm going. And, and therefore, God has just got me isolated. That's the idea that God has extracted me from the world. I've given my life to Christ. I am not of this world. I'm from another world. God never extracts you out of the world, out of hostility, out of the devil's reach. You know what it says? I thought Christ got the victory at the cross. You know, Satan still bites, even though he's defeated. I've seen actual footage of a snake who's had his head chopped off and has still bit something, somebody. So his head was gone, but he was still attacking. The bite is still there. But he, eternally speaking, there is no more teeth in Satan. He's overcome. But this fallen world is one that we are being not extracted from, but being inserted into. Jesus inserted himself into this fallen world. And he was sent back up after he completed everything on the cross and rose from the dead. He sent it back up to the throne of glory. And now he repels his believers. Once they are born again, born from above, we are inserted into the world as his disciples. He says, go. I will make you fellow pew warmers. I, he didn't say that. He says, go. I will make you disciples so that you may go and fish for lost souls. Fish for lost souls. That's what we are doing. And that's what everyone is called. And he's equipped us to do that. So, when we have given our life to Christ, he inserts us into the world. We become players in his eternal game. The church was birthed for the world. That day of Pentecost, the church was born. Jesus said, you are my body. I am the head of this church. I am the head. What is the church here for? A fallen world needs a risen Savior. What is the church here for? To display and to declare God to the world. That's what the church was birthed for. It wasn't birthed for to have our own communion and have uh, the best potlucks and siren donuts and outside jamboree in October and, and the pageant that we have every Christmas with Mary and Joseph in a broken cradle and somebody can't find the, the, the doll baby that's missing the head. You know, you try to put all these things together and you open them old dusty closets and there's all them old things that women who have since gone into the kingdom of heaven for many decades sewed originally at some earlier day. And uh, it's not what it's about. God didn't birth the church so the church would be their isolated bubble doing what they do. God birthed the church to intermingle, to be woven into the fabric of the lost world. But we're that thread, like that red thread going through this black, big 
ball of yarn, okay? We don't ever want to look like a black thread so we can't be told apart from the world. We are that red thread with the testimony of Jesus and His blood that runs through this world. And the more red thread that runs through there, the more red thread, this black thread will change to red by the light, by the salt. So, we are to, as a church, to display, declare God to the world. That's what Israel was supposed to do. Israel was supposed to be, this is what people who follow me are going to look like. And God says, okay, Israel, here's what you're going to do. You're my people, I'm your God. Here's the rules. Done deal. Bada bing, bada bang. I'm also going to use you to show you, show the world what my children look like. And I'm going to bring a Messiah. The one who's going to save this cursed world through you. Okay, that's what the Israel was supposed to do. And they mess up continually and continually. And the church is supposed to do that. And guess what? You're going to mess up. You're going to screw things up. But I've never read in here anywhere where God says, that's the third X. You're gone. Go sit down. Give me your helmet, bat, and gloves, and bat. You're on the bench. God doesn't send anyone to the bench. God doesn't say you messed up way too many times. Okay? We have a mission. Proclaim the gospel of Christ. And as we're doing that, as we are proclaiming the gospel of Christ, we are displaying and declaring God to the world. So, as disciples, just to recap, I'm closing it up here, but just so we can bring it home, we're going to go through things where Jesus, at the end of the Sermon on the Mount, in chapter 7, He's going to say, because of everything I told you, He doesn't say this, this is a summary, because of everything that I just said, blessed is this, blessed is that, you've heard it said that a man could divorce his wife, but I say, and you've heard it said that you should uh, not love or hate your enemy. But I say, anyways, he's going to show all these things. He's going to go through all this stuff. Be salt, be light. And then he's going to say, because I said all this, what are you going to do about it? What are you, because he summed it up at the end. Look at all this stuff. People are like, who can do this? What is it? What? This, is, this bar is really high. He's asking a lot of us. Imagine people had questions and stuff. That's what he said. What are you going to do about it? And we're going to learn as, as we go through. You guys have heard the narrow gate. Enter in at the narrow gate. That there's two entrances, two paths, two crowds, two destinations. We're going to look at that because he says, also, when you're asking yourself what you're going to do about it, when you're out there proclaiming the gospel, you've got to let these people know that there's a blessing and a curse laid before them. There's life and death laid before them. There's two trees that bear two different fruits laid before them. There's two destinations and two roads with two gates. And two crowds of people are going down them, and they lead to two different places. There's two different buildings that have two different foundations with two different builders. There's choices you need to make. There's only one right choice. And, and this is how he's going to sum it up. So as we go through this, remember, Jesus is talking about what do my children look like? I want to know, if you want to know what my kingdom looks like, he's answering it right now. If you want to know what the people, the citizens of my kingdom look like, He's answering it right now. But remember, as you go through this, don't get frustrated going, man, I can't live up to any of this. Because God is rich in mercy. God understands that. But he'll give you that grace. Where even in all of our mess up in this, is that a word, anybody? Mess up in this? Have you come right across that in your textbooks? Okay. <laughs> in all of our spiritual, physical, emotional mess up in this, he still uses us. He uses us. And you can go through and go, wow, he used the harlot. Wow, he used a murderer. Wow, he can use a, a knucklehead like me. So, that's what we're called to be. Children of his kingdom, going out proclaiming the gospel of Jesus Christ to a lost world. And we do it with mercy, wisdom, grace, and love. Amen? Amen. I'm going to pray as, as the band comes up. Next week, we're going to get into those things about the law. And God says, you say this about anger, but I say this. The law says this about lust, but I say this. So we're going to see how these kingdom spiritual things are kind of uh, upside down to what we normally expect. Father, I just pray that we can just live these truths out to your glory. We can only do it through your power. In Jesus' name, amen. This song is kind of fitting right now. Goodness of God. 
I, uh, my husband texted to say he broke down. He uh, brought Lauren and went back home real quick. Couldn't come back. <laughs> so I called him to see what was going on. I don't know. I could tell he was under the car, which is uh, funny because he can't really bend right now. But and he said, "Thank you, Jesus." And I was like, "I said I can see my starter wire just dangling." I said, "Thank the Lord." <laughs> but to him, that was such a good thing. But <laughs> praise him with the, the dangling starter wire. Like, I love you.
and pick it up in the morning or in the evening or in the middle of the afternoon or all day long and you find these promises and it says they are yes and amen. Those promises can be applied to your life, to be lived out in your life. They are yes and amen. Let it be so. Let it be so, these promises, Lord. Thanks, everybody, for coming in. I want you to have a blessed week and take the love of Christ out to this dark world because we know they need it. And uh, let's ignite that world with the love of Christ. Amen? God bless.